Hi folks, this is Dr. Rob Sivas. I'm the Carb Addiction Doc and I'm affiliated with a practice and in that practice we've been seeing more and more young athletes, male and female, typically endurance athletes, who are coming in with cardiovascular arrhythmias. The rhythm of the heart is abnormal and often dangerously abnormal and the problem is that most doctors look at them and use the eyeball test, the eyeball CT scanner, to say, ah, you're young, you're an athlete, you run a, uh, you know, a 230 marathon, how can you have heart disease? Don't worry about it, you'll be fine, those are benign. Maybe, maybe not. But in our practice now, we are seeing patient after patient after patient, elite or high level athletes, usually endurance athletes, some are marathon runners, some are triathletes, some are swimmers, we've had a couple of swimmers lately, and then now increasingly, what we call land and water rowers. Folks that are in the gym all the time, but they use the rowing machine. Um, my friend Sean Baker is huge on his rowing machine. Um, or they are rowers or paddlers, kayakers. Um, here in Florida, we see a lot of uh, folks that are spending time paddling on the water. And they come in with arrhythmias. So let's explore this and develop a line of thinking to protect you from having a sudden heart attack or dying from a heart block. What athletes do very well is ignore early symptoms. They try to outrun them. And this is not just for athletes, this is for everybody. So let's break it down. Number one, the textbook will tell you that a normal heart rate is between 60 and 100. If you're above 100, that's called a tachycardia. If you're below 60, that's called a bradycardia, slow heart rate. And those are already abnormalities, although they may be innocuous. Now, here's what's interesting. On a low-carbohydrate diet, on a ketogenic diet, on a carnivore diet, the typical person commonly runs bradycardic, commonly run with heart rate in the high 40s, early 50s. Then if you add in physical fitness to that, if you exercise regularly, you may even drop that heart rate even lower. If you're eating a decent amount of salt, if you're not overhydrated, your levels may be low. Normal. But the first thing is, if you're regularly bradycardic, pay attention and figure out whether that is normal for you or not. And there are a couple of things you can do at home. So the first thing you do is check your blood pressure. Blood pressure will be running low, which is fine. If your blood pressure is above 135 over 85 or below 100 over 60, bring that to somebody's attention. That needs treatment or at least investigation. Okay? 135 over 85, 100 over 60. Definitely above 140 over 90 or 100 over 60 if you're symptomatic. But even if you're not symptomatic, get those guys checked out, especially if associated with a low heart rate. Now, while you're doing your blood pressure, you can put an oxygen saturation monitor on your finger and just look at that light or listen to the beep and make sure it's very, very regular. Most of our eyes can see that, our ears can hear that. If there are skip beats, that may or may not be serious. Or if there are long pauses, that may or may not be serious. Otherwise, you can use a smartwatch. Some of them are good, some of them are not. But you can use an aura ring, a smartwatch, something that looks at your heart rate and gives you information. And the first thing that we see in our athletes, but in everybody, is you may even be running in the 40s, particularly when you're asleep. And the impairment of electrical conduction through the atrioventricular node, the node between the atria and the ventricle, is an important cause of heart block, or really is the cause of heart block. So we've got an SA node, sinoatrial node, that triggers an electrical impulse. So your atria, the upper chambers that fill with blood, squeeze and push the blood from the atria. They received it from either the lungs on the left side or the body on the right side. They squeeze that blood into the ventricles and the ventricles are big muscular chambers, left side more muscular than the left side, that when they squeeze simultaneously, they pump blood out to the lungs or to the body. Right side goes to the lungs, left side goes to the body, and then comes back, that blood comes back to the atria, goes back down to the ventricles. So the SA node up at the 
atria regulates atrial contraction, squeezing the blood through two valves into the ventricles. Then between the uh, um, atria and the ventricles, there's a second node. So pulse contraction, that pulse runs to the AV node. AV node sends a second pulse that contracts the ventricles. When there is a disconnection or a dysfunction of the AV node, that second node, that can lead to heart block. And heart block refers to the impairment of electrical conduction through the AV or atrioventricular node. Now, the first form of heart block called first degree AV block, which we see commonly in our athletes, commonly, is where the impulses are all conducted. So they go SA node, AV node, down to the ventricles. But the early phase of that beat, the PR interval, is prolonged. It's longer than it should be before you get a trigger. And that may be part of having a very low heart rate, but it is already a minor abnormality. It's usually asymptomatic other than, hey, my heart rate's low, but that's why you want to look at this on an EKG lead. Is my PR interval lengthened? Now, most doctors are going to blow that off. Ketone IQ has recently come out with a product. It's this, it's the regular ketone IQ um, uh, ketone supplement, exogenous ketone, but this one contains caffeine, okay? And I've been playing around with it. I do get a boost. I've had some people just not like the caffeine. Uh, it gets their heart racing too much. I found value to this. However, here's what intrigued me. This ketone IQ is made from a green tea extract. And the caffeine comes from green tea. And I, man, I didn't understand that. And I went to look at some of the green teas. I, I drink mostly rooibos tea, but I looked at some of my green teas. And the majority of my green teas that I have in my home contain a sizable amount of caffeine. So be very cautious. Look at the green tea you're drinking, especially if you're drinking it between dinner and bedtime when I try not to drink caffeine. Make sure that there is no caffeine there. Don't be fooled. And know the product because this, this ketone IQ was an aha moment for me. Now, the green tea ketone IQ is something I use from time to time in the morning. I've been playing around with it as a surrogate for my first cup of coffee, on, particularly on run days for me. And I've noticed that it's a, it's a really, really cool thing to run on early in the morning. There's no way I'm going to take this in the evening. But look into the green tea. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. I know other teas do. But check out your green tea and make sure it isn't laced with caffeine. And it's usually associated with bradycardia in athletes or during sleep for an, for an otherwise normal person. But it can progress to higher degrees of heart block. And that's the concern. So if you know you know and you want to know, what's my PR interval? If you're really smart, you've got a low heart rate, you want to either look at an EKG or ask your doctor, what is my PR interval? And if it's longer than 200 milliseconds, that may be a problem. Benign problem, but it's a real problem. Now we get into second degree AV block. And second degree AV block is divided into two things, Mobitz type 1 and Mobitz type 2. So you've got bradycardia, a lengthened PR interval, first degree block. Now we're going to talk about the second degree block. The first one, the Mobitz one, or Wenkebach or Wenkebach um, uh, AV block, is where that PR interval slowly gets longer and longer and longer to the point that you drop a beat. So you've got beat, 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 and you actually may even see some PVCs, premature ventricular complexes, early on in the interval. A lot of people say, ah, oh, PVCs are fine, but if they're occurring frequently, if they're occurring in runs, they're occurring in doublets, that is more of a concern. And you'll see the PVCs. But in type 1, Mobitz type 1 block, or type 1, heart, uh, uh, type 1 Venkerbach block, you get a lengthening, 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 which you can see on an EKG, and then a drop beat. So you see a beat, a beat, a beat, a beat. And that blocked interval may be one or more beats that haven't gone through. Now, it's very commonly related to the vagus nerve. 
So you know that one where you push on the neck in films and the person faints? That's the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve controls the heart. So if that rate is very low, if it's a lot of parasympathetic override, you may see a drop type 1 beat. It's usually benign. It's often benign. It's common in young athletes. It's common in young athletes and it's common in people on a carnivore diet. And it's usually not a dangerous thing. And as you exercise, you increase your heart rate. Um, and with exercise, it may resolve. Ways to increase that heart rate may resolve it. So you, most cardiologists are going to say, oh, it's type 1, it's Venkabak, it's benign, it's okay. That is true in the moment, but it's not necessarily true in your lifetime. So pay attention to it. Then what can happen is that beat where you drop the PR interval gets longer and you drop a beat in a reliable way that may change and it may enter what we call a Mobitz type 2 where now you're getting drop beats without progressive PR interval uh, length so PR interval lengthens 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 you drop a beat that's Mobitz type 1 Mobitz type 2 PR interval hasn't even had a chance to lengthen you just drop a beat that's a block. That's a heart block. AV node is not conducting that down and it's skipping beats. And this may be, may be due to the, what we call a Hisperkinji system disease. But those sudden, sudden drop beats without PR interval lengthening, very difficult to distinguish between type 1 and type 2 block. Those are always abnormal, always abnormal and can lead to complete heart block. And the cause is significant bradycardia over time and maybe in an athlete, the stretched septum, the stretched wall. Because in endurance athletes, the left ventricle gets very thick because it's pumping at a very high rate and a very hard pump to be able to supply blood for endurance athletes. And when those walls thicken and they, the, the wall dynamics change, they can affect the electrical conduction. So we see if you've got bradycardia, always look to see if you're skipping beats. And if you're skipping beats, you're going to need an electrophysiologist to determine if it's PR lengthening or if it's sudden skip beats. If you are skipping beats on a regular basis and that interval is lengthening. I saw a patient the other day that was having 12 to 15 seconds without a beat. Elite athlete. Run over 70 marathons in his lifetime. Young, in his 40s. Got a pacemaker. Got a pacemaker just a couple of weeks ago. See patients dropping dead during a race because they didn't get this fixed. Heart block. So please pay attention to it, athletes. Because you're all proud of you, bro, oh, I'm lucky my heart rate's low. That's great. I love bradycardia. I run bradycardic as well. Run the 50s. I'm a fat old guy. But I make sure I don't have those heart blocks. I make sure I don't have those skip beats. I don't want them. And I want to know about them. Because if you progress to third degree AV block, complete heart block, then the ventricles contract and the, and uh, sorry, the atria contract and the ventricles do not. The ventricles may initiate their own beat. Obviously, that's what's going to keep you alive. Ventricles stop working, you're dead. But that's where the atria and the ventricles are out of coordination. They're not contracting properly. We call that AV dissociation. And it's called ventricular escape, where you're getting a very, you're getting a normal atrial rate or even a high atrial rate, but a very, very slow 20 to 40 beat of ventricular rate. And that is a dangerous bradycardia. That's where you may faint, you feel tremendous fatigue, and your fittest athletes may not faint, but they're going to feel very fatigued. And that requires urgent pacing. You think, oh, that's never going to happen to me. We've had, I think, five, maybe six patients in the last month, maybe six weeks, that have come in with this diagnosis. So please, 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 if you have bradycardia, be proud of it, but also be analytical of it. Do you have a heart block? Do you have first degree block, PR interval lengthening? Do you have a Mobitz type 1 where you're getting drop beats? Do you have a Mobitz type 2 
We don't have PR length, interval lengthening and you're dropping beats. And do you have third degree block, which is a medical emergency? Get to know your rhythm abnormalities. And you know what we haven't even mentioned here, folks? We haven't even mentioned atrial fibrillation, which we also see fairly commonly in our athletes. Very often when they get a little bit older. So I had a patient a little bit ago, I think he's 61 or 62 years old, had PVCs for a long time. He was going to go and have surgery, had an EKG. You're in atrial fibrillation, dude. <gasps> but I'm fit, I'm an athlete, I've run all these marathons. Okay, you've got atrial fibrillation, need an ablation. We see it regularly, folks. And atrial fibrillation is a deadly disease because it can cause clots. Had a patient just two days ago, came through the practice, had, very unusual, a clot break off, had both a stroke and a heart attack within 24 hours of each other, both from clots that broke off due to atrial fibrillation. In our athletes, and our endurance athletes, the rowers, for example, um, we just saw a paper a little bit ago, came out a week or so ago, in uh, competitive rowers, who have arrhythmias who go into atrial fibrillation where the ventricle is so big and pumping so hard it's rubbing against the pericardium and irritating itself and causing arrhythmias. We see Purkinje fibers triggering arrhythmia. Those are little muscle cords that hold valves and hold structure in the ventricles being a cause of arrhythmias, not just the pulmonary artery, or sorry, pulmonary vein which is where the common atrial fibrillation comes from. Know your rhythm, because everybody's worried about plaque in their heart. Most people don't pay adequate attention to rhythm abnormalities. And there's medications you can use, but often you need an ablation. And the risk with a rhythm abnormality is not just a heart attack, it's more commonly a stroke. And that's where aspirin and blood thinners make a difference. But you've got to be proactive about this. You can't wait until after your stroke to get treated. And if you're worried, if you're worried at all, give us a shout, come and see the practice, and we can help you to figure this out. Even though we're not cardiologists, we practice way more. I'm going to say this as a statement. We practice every single day preventive cardiology. Where the doctors that label themselves as preventive cardiologists are incapable of doing that because... When you're doing prevention, you don't have the signs and symptoms that are required to test you. Isn't that bizarre? You have to already be symptomatic and have an event before the preventive cardiologist can look at preventing heart disease. How upside down is that? How upside down is that? That's like saying you've got to have a lump before you get a mammogram. That is cardiology, the status of, and we are far better at cardiologists at screening than they are themselves. Because the best screening test they can do is an LDL and put you on a statin. Kumbaya, saved.